shop there. So at some point between the time that I moved to Burlington and 2005, she moved back to Bristol, Vermont, which is where she was born and raised, which is south of Burlington and kind of to the west of Lake Champlain. So she was born and, and raised in the region but had moved away. Uh, at the time that she got her picture in 1977, she was living in um, Connecticut and was just there. She had just gotten married to Anthony Manzi, and they were there on a vacation, a honeymoon vacation with the, the two kids, her, her daughter Heidi and her son Larry. And they were, like I said, they were just on a vacation when they happened to be passing by the lake and got her picture. Right, we should uh, tell they everybody. were living in New Haven. I think they were living in New Haven, Connecticut, and she was working for either Westinghouse or, no, General Dynamics, building parts of submarines, believe it or not. <laughs> that's what she used to do for a living. Oh, that's so cool. anyway, I went to one of her lectures in 2005 and, you know, told her who I was and got to know her a little bit, <clears throat> and she gave me an autograph picture. And then we bumped into each other again when Monster Quest did their champ episode. And we sort of stayed in touch ever since then. And, uh, you know, somebody would come to town wanting to make a documentary, and I'd say, oh, you should get in touch with Santa Manzi. And, you know, we would uh, bump into each other again during filming of different documentaries and stuff, and we became friends. And, um, you know... Um, we should tell everybody, uh, Sandra Manzi is the lady who took the most famous picture of Champ. It's, it's, if you've ever seen, uh, if you, it, you know, if you look up Champ, the lake monster, and you look at all the pictures, uh, you're going to see one that you've probably seen before in pop culture. Uh, and, yeah, it's the most and, famous photograph of Champ beyond doubt, which is fact, there's only a handful, you know. She took like six photos or something. And uh, uh, my understanding like, is is that she already had a bunch of family pictures on the roll of film, and only had a couple of exposures left, and she only took the one photograph. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's it. Whole, oh, you know what I'm thinking of? Yeah, because they have the the technology today where they can shift the angles, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff. I think that's what I'm thinking of. But uh, anyways. Um, yeah, and that was an uh, that was an amazing photo, and if nobody's checked it out, you should do an uh, an image search. I know if you do an image search on Google, you'll find it. You can't miss it. Yeah, there's been a lot of work done on the photograph, and you know some people think that it could be a a, a very unusual piece of wood debris. I personally don't think that. I think it's an animal, and it looks like either a giant snake or possibly the long neck of a plesiosaur looking over its back, you know? So, and then, of course, William passed away. Yeah, you know, William was starting to get sick when we were there in 2017. He'd already had uh, gallbladder surgery, and they had had to put some kind of a stent in his gallbladder, and he was just recovering from that when we were actually out on the lake. And then, I don't know, a couple of months after we got back, he told me he had pancreatic cancer. And I was like, oh, boy, you know, that's that's hard to beat, you know. And slowly, I guess, over time, it spread from his pancreas into other parts of his body. And he fought it as much as he could. He moved to Florida to be near his daughter in Pensacola and was going back and forth to the Carolinas for um, chemotherapy. And this chemotherapy, I talked to him on the phone, man, he just was, the, the chemotherapy was almost worse on him than the cancer was. I mean, he would be really sick and in pain. And, you know, we were going to try to get together in 2018. And the plan was he was supposed to go talk about the work we had been doing at Lauren Coleman's Cryptozoology Conference last year. And the original plan was that he was going to go 
speak at Lauren's conference and then immediately from there meet me at the lake with the boat. Oh, cool. And he got too sick um, to do either one. So he was unable to go to the cryptozoology conference, but he was able to donate one of the cameras, the in-order cameras that he built that we used, to Lawrence Cryptozoology Museum. Well, that's cool. So, yeah. And um, I wound up going to Lake Champlain without him uh, in 2017. When Will wasn't there, I have a friend that's been helping me that lives in Colchester, Vermont, named John Cronin. And John has access to a smaller boat. So when Will wasn't around, we were able to go out and do a few things using the smaller boat in 2017. And uh, me and John were able to do some stuff this past summer. Um, <clears throat> you've seen the uh, On the Trail of Champ, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, you remember the diver that was working with Katie Elizabeth? Yes. Okay, he was supposed to have worked with us last summer, too, but he had problems, family problems that came up, and he was unable to make it. So we had a lot of projects in mind using a diver, but unfortunately Jeremy wasn't able to make it. So I tried to do a little bit of that. What we wanted to do was explore some of these places that might have underwater caves. And I talk about this on the Champ documentary, on the Trail of Champ, and the idea is they know in the ocean in, in some places – they have found skeletons of sea turtles inside underwater caves. They don't know if these turtles go in there on purpose to die or whether they swim into these caves and somehow can't figure out how to get their way out and uh, suffocate and die in them. But nevertheless, they find the bones of these sea turtles in these caves. And in some places, they find multiple skeletons, you know, like a, like a sea turtle graveyard. And they also find the skeletons of manatees and occasionally alligators and crocodiles. So I thought that this would be, if there are underwater caves in Lake Champlain, that this might be a fertile place to look for bones of recently dead ones. And also significant to this question is the fact that Lake Champlain right at the end of the Ice Age, was much larger and was salt water, and it was called the Champlain Sea. You know, we have a couple questions from the chat room, and one sure, of them um, has to do with what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. uh, which one? Can you read that? Or your eyes? I can read it. Yeah, she can't see the big screen yet because of her dilation. Uh, let's see. Um, oh yeah, okay. So um, one one person in the chat room would Sudan would like to know: Could the guest review the geologic uh, history of the Lake Champlain for the audience members not up to speed on the subject? Yeah, well, this ties in directly to what I'm talking about. So yeah, I'll Perfect. just I'll, I'll set Perfect. that up first. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> At the very end of the last glaciation. There were multiple glaciations of, of the Ice Age. Um, say 40,000 years ago, Lake Champlain was a solid block of ice. Imagine a glacier a mile thick. That's how, how thick this ice was. It was an iceberg. What is now Lake Champlain was completely filled with ice. I mean, it was a solid block of ice. Then about roughly 14,000 years ago, all this ice started melting, and all that meltwater had to go somewhere. So what happened was, as the ice was melting in front of this melting glacier, there was all this water. I mean, it just caused ridiculous flooding. And as it got you know, deeper, it created a large 
freshwater lake in front of the glacier where Lake Champlain is now, and also in southern parts of the Canadian provinces of Quebec and Ontario. And in the geology literature, <clears throat> this is called Lake Vermont. It was a very large body of, of unproductive fresh water, but at the, the time this was all going on, certain types of fish started reinvading this body of water and coming back to places they had lived before the ice came. So you had this huge body of, of fresh water. Okay, about 12,500 years ago, the glacier had melted to the point that the Atlantic Ocean came flooding in from the sea. The fresh water was flushed out, and the ocean actually came in. So this body of fresh water became salt water and became the Champlain Sea. When this happened, whales and seals and all sorts of marine animals started living in what is now Lake Champlain. And the thing you have to understand is that as big as Lake Champlain is now, it was only a small fjord in this large inland sea that was mostly up in southern Quebec and Ontario. I mean, it was huge. It was, it was bigger than the Great Lakes combined. That's how huge it was. And, and it was salt water. So it stayed in this state for about 2,500 years and then what happened to, to change that is that if you understand about plate tectonics and how the continental plates on the Earth move around on a layer of lava, the, con the continents are constantly moving around, but they're, they're moving at such a slow rate that we can't see it. It's happening so slowly. But <clears throat> all the continents of the Earth are sitting on top of a layer of lava that they move around on. So when the ice was there back about 14,000 years ago, that mile-thick layer of ice had weighted down the continental plates and made them sink down further than they normally would from all that weight. Okay, when the ice was gone, it took time for those continental plates to bounce back up, but they eventually started to bounce back up. So about 10,000 years ago, the continental plates around Lake Champlain had uplifted to the point that it cut off the marine influence on the Champlain Sea. When this happened, the water slowly began to turn back to fresh water again. Scott? And, yes. We are going to have to break for a commercial here. Oh, okay, uh, sure. Can you hold that thought? Absolutely. You are listening to Paraversal Universe. It is time for another com or for our second commercial break. We will be right back with our guests for the next segment. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. 